There you go. Okay, well, uh, today we're very happy to have Ashok Sen. Uh, for for people that uh, haven't met him, uh, Ashok is one of the real masters of string theory in the world, um, has made uh, many important contributions to the subject over the last few decades. And uh, so we're very happy to have him today. And uh, he's going to tell us about, um, no, I don't have the title in front of me, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll share it. Share it. And then... <clears throat> Good. Okay. So he's going to tell us about uh, D instanton uh, contributions in, in type zero string theory. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me to this, uh, for this uh, seminar. Okay. So what I'm uh, planning to do today is to give a general introduction to physics of D instantons and then the specific role that they play in type zero B string theory. So let me begin by describing the role of D instantons. Okay, what D instantons are. So D instantons are like ordinary deep dense in string theory. Okay? And the only thing that characterizes them, okay, which is distinct from uh, ordinary deep dense, is that they have the boundary condition along all non-compact directions. And that includes the Euclidean time direction. Okay? So this means that these are these can be thought of as solutions in string theory that are localized, not only in all non-compact space direction, but also in the time direction. So they describe finite action classical solutions in string theory. And as all d bends, the action is proportional to one over g string and not one over g string squared. Okay, so I'll write this as c over g, gs where c is some constant. And because these are finite action classical solutions, they don't describe particle-like states. Instead, they are like saddle points of the Euclidean path integral. They give non perturbative correction to string amplitudes. And because that action is C over GS, the amplitudes are proportional to the exponential of minus C over GS. And then the wall sheet theory of closed and open strings provide expressions for the D instant on contribution to the amplitudes. So what this means is the following, that just like the ordinary uh, string amplitudes, you have to carry out integration over the modulized spaces of Riemann's circles. But because you have deep ends, okay, or D instant on, so you also have to allow Riemann surfaces with boundaries where the uh, wall sheet can end. And so by summing over modulized, by integrating over modulized spaces of Riemann surface with boundaries, we can generate the series expansion in the string coupling that multiplies this factor of it to the minus C over GS. So a typical Dean center induced amplitude, we have the structure that there is an overall factor of it to the minus C over GS. And then there is a series expansion in the power of the string coupling GS. And the coefficients of that series expansion can be obtained formally as integrals over the modulized spaces of Riemann surfaces. However, there is a problem that the modulized space integrals often diverge from regions of the modulized space where the Riemann surface degenerates. And in the theory of open and closed strings, which means in uh, uh, theory of wall sheets with boundaries, there can be two different distinct kinds of degeneration of Riemann surfaces. Okay. One class is when a neck becomes small, okay, where neck basically means you have a closed cycle which becomes small. Okay. That's called the closed string degeneration because it's like a closed string is um, pinching. Okay. Or a strip becomes, um, the width of a strip becomes uh, small. Okay. And these correspond to open string degeneration. And so in order to make sense of these divergences and extract a finite result, we need to take help of string field theory. And this is what I'll try to describe in the next slide. And it turns out that the tools of string field theory is essential for the open string degeneration for D instantons. And it's not essential, but it's very useful for closed string degeneration. And we'll see examples of these as we proceed. So let me say a few words about string field theory, what it achieves. So first of all, string field theory can be thought of as a regular quantum field theory. The only difference is that it has infinite number of fields. 
and basically it has one field for every mode of the state. And just like in ordinary quantum field theory, the perturbative amplitudes in string field theory are given by some of Feynman diagrams. The propagator of a string field is proportional to L0 inverse, where L0 is a wall sheet scaling generator. And you can make can relate this to the usual propagator that you are familiar with in quantum field theory by noting that the L0 eigenvalues of various string states are in fact proportional to k square plus m square. Okay, where k is the momentum carried by that um, string and m square is the mass square of the particular open string state that um, we focus on. Okay. So this L0 inverse essentially encodes the propagator <coughs> of all the infinite set of, 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 of uh, string uh, fields. Okay. And when you look at specific eigenvalues of L0 inverse, you get the usual propagator one over k square plus m square. And string field theory is designed so that formally the sum of our Feynman diagrams reproduce the wall sheet expression. Okay, so it's not that string field theory is something new, it's designed to reproduce the wall sheet result for string amplitudes. But the way we get the wall sheet result is somewhat indirect in the sense that you have to first represent this propagator L0 inverse using its Schrodinger parameterization. So we write L0 inverse as integral dt to the minus L0 t. Okay, where t is the Schrodinger parameter. So this is the usual Schrodinger parameter of, that we use in even in normal quantum field theory. Okay. And it turns out that after you represent the propagator in this fashion, okay, and then put together all the uh, uh, vortices and propagators, then these t's become the moduli of Riemann surfaces after change of variables. Okay. So the wall sheet expression, which involves carrying out integration over the moduli of Riemann surfaces, essentially comes from the integration over the Schrodinger parameters t. Okay, and that's the relation between the way string field theory encodes the uh, amplitudes and the way wall sheet encodes the amplitudes. Okay, it proceeds via the Schrodinger parameter. Now, if we focus on this relation, okay, one can understand where the divergences come from. Okay, and in fact, this that if this t integral, okay, the divergence in the t integral is basically the root cause of all the divergences that we encountered in integration over the moduli spaces of Riemann surfaces. Okay. So let's examine this relation a little more detail. So you can see that this relation is an identity as long as the L0 eigenvalue is positive. Okay, because for positive L0 eigenvalue, right, right hand side is a finite integral, and you can easily check that that gives you L0 inverse. Now, when L0 is negative, okay. then you can see that the right hand side diverges because it, it, this, this is exponentially uh, growing as for large D, okay. but the left hand side is finite. Okay. And so, in this case, we can, the, if we use a wall sheet description, which basically uses the right hand side, okay. then you may get divergence as T goes to infinity. Okay. But these divergences are uh, removed once you use, use the string field theory expression namely L0 inverse with negative L0. Now, the special case where both sides divert is when L0 vanishes, when L0 is equal to zero. In this case, using the left-hand side directly doesn't help. Okay. Nevertheless, okay, we can interpret the divergence on the left-hand side much better than on the right-hand side. Okay, Because on the right-hand side, the divergence is coming from integration over the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. But on the left hand side, you can see that the, van the vanishing of L0 basically means that we are sitting on the pole of a propagator in a Feynman diagram. And whenever you sit on a pole of a propagator in a Feynman diagram, okay, we can use the usual quantum field theory insights to deal with that. Okay, we know in quantum field theory, under what circumstances we actually are on the pole of a uh, propagator. And there are standard ways that we can deal with this. So this is the reason why quantum, the string field theory picture, the string field theory description of the string amplitudes helps us getting around the divergences that we encounter in the wall sheet formalism. And we'll see, as I said, during the course of this talk, how exactly this is done. Just, just a question, so in that discussion, is this applying both in open string field theory and closed string field theory? 
Yeah, so you can think the most general situation is a is a field theory of open and closed strings. Uh -huh. So you can think of the open strings as and the closed strings as degrees of freedom of the theory, and you can uh, uh, work with that. Okay, thank you. But the open strings are actually not going to be the external states because open strings in this case will be living on D instantons, right? Those are transient states. Those are like the modes of the soliton. That if you have an instanton, then it has its uh, uh, excitation modes. Which you all integrate over, but they are not asymptotic states. So the external states will be closed states. Okay, so this is as much as I'll say about the general introduction for uh, D instantons. Okay, now let me turn to type zero B string theory. So type zero B string theory is a string theory in two dimensions. It's like a normal critical string theory with uh, total central charge adding up to uh, uh, 15. So the world set theory of type zero B string theory contains a free scalar X zero and it's super partner Maharana fermion, which I'll denote by psi zero. So these two together give central charge three, three by two. Then it has a super Liouville theory with central charge 27 over two. Okay. And this describes the space direction. Okay, so the x, the x0 you know, it describes the time direction and the Liouville field describes the space direction. Okay. So the total central charge of these two together is 15. Okay. And then it has the usual B C beta gamma and uh, B bar C bar beta bar gamma over ghosts. Okay, so B C are the ghosts associated with the world sheet diffeomorphism invariance, and beta gamma and beta bar gamma, but these are the ghosts associated with world sheet and super um, symmetry invariance. Now, as in the normal superstring theory, there is GSO projection. But uh, what distinguishes type 0 B theory from, say, type 2 theory okay, is that the GSO projection acts simultaneously on the left and the right sector. Okay. Whereas in type 2 string theory, you have separate GSO projection rules on the left sector of the world sheet and the right sector of the world sheet. Okay. Here, we have simultaneous action on the left and right sector. Okay. And as a consequence, this theory has only the Nebuchadnezzar's Nebuchadnezzar sector or the Ramon Ramon sector, but no Nebuchadnezzar's Ramon or Ramon and Nebuchadnezzar sectors, which means that you only have bosonic uh, fields. Okay, that's so the closed string spectrum in type zero B string theory has only bosonic fields. And when, if you analyze the physical spectrum of this, of this theory, one finds that the physical spectrum, in fact, consists of just two master scalars. Okay? One coming from the Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar sector, which I'll denote by phi ns, and the other one coming from the Ramon Ramon sector, which I'll denote by phi r. Okay, so that's the total, the full spectrum of the theory. Now, this string theory has D instantons and anti D instantons. These are obtained by imposing what is called the ZZ Ben boundary condition on the Liouville field. So, this is basically the analog of the Didisle boundary condition on the Liouville uh, direction. And we also impose the standard it is a boundary condition on the x0, so that's size 0. So these are finite action classical solutions in this uh, two-dimensional string theory. And as a result, they give non perturbative contribution to the S matrix that is proportional to e to the minus pi by gs. Okay, so that's constant c in this case is pi. Okay, and gs is the appropriately normalized closed string coupling constant. Okay. And throughout this talk, I'll be working in the alpha prime equal to 2 convention. Okay, that says a string tension to be one over two pi. And the reason for using this convention is that, you, uh, I mean, we can compare our results with the results of Balthazar, Rodriguez, and Nin, because many of the results that we get can be compared with whatever they, they found. Okay, and they use the alpha prime equal to two convention. So that's the reason why we choose to work in alpha prime equal to two convention. Now, the reason that this type zero B string theory is interesting is because it has a dual matrix model description. Okay. And the matrix model description, in fact, is very simple. Okay. It's a collection of free non-interacting fermions moving under an inverted harmonic oscillator potential. Okay, so the single particle Hamiltonian that each fermion sees is this P square by two minus Q square by two. Okay. Now, this, of course, is unbounded from below. Okay, the energy is unbounded from below. But because these are fermions, we have a choice that we can fill all the energy levels below a certain value okay. and define a Fermi C. 
So in this case, we will take the Fermi level to be a height mu below the top of the potential. So here is our Fermi level. Okay. And once you have a Fermi C, then of course the excitations have bounded energy. Okay, there is no uh, negative energy excitations anymore on this Fermi C by definition because the Fermi C itself is defined as a zero energy state. And okay, so here the of course you have the usual formulaic excitations. Okay, you can excite a formulon or a hole, okay, which basically means that you just remove a formulon from below the Fermi C. Okay. So those turn out to correspond to D-brain like states in this, okay, D0 brains in the in this theory. The usual closed strings, okay, the in the dual description are created by this composite operator psi dagger psi, which essentially creates a formulon hole pair. Okay. So the closed strings in this description are the formulon hole pair excitations. And one can show that the formulon hole pair excitations in this case describe master scalars. Okay. So if you take a formulon hole scalar uh, pair excitation on the right of the potential, they describe a master scalar chi r. And if you excite a formulon hole pair on the left of the potential of the uh, barrier, then they describe a, uh, field, a master scalar chi m. And the map that relates the string theory, the type 0 v string theory to this matrix model, okay, basically tells us that phi ns is given by the sum of chi l and chi r, and the Ramon sector field is given by the difference of chi l and chi r, okay, up to an overall normalization. So this is the relation between the uh, type 0 v string theory and the dual matrix model. So from this viewpoint, the perturbative closed string amplitudes are mapped to reflection of formulon hole PR from the barrier, ignoring tunneling. So you throw in a formulon hole PR from one side, and it comes back. Okay? That's the uh, uh, picture of the scattering. Okay, it may come back to multiple, come back as multiple formulon hole PRs okay, in uh, principle. The effect of tunneling is what is uh, uh, important for us, what will be important for us. Okay. And this is captured by D instant tunnels. Okay, so essentially tunneling is the D instant one. Okay, that's the way the map between string theory and the matrix model works. So we'll choose the convention in which D instant turns correspond to effect of formulon tunneling from right to left, or a whole tunneling from left to right. And anti D instant turn is opposite. It's the effect of whole tunneling from right to left, or formulon tunneling from left to right. So with this description, we can see that a D instanton, okay, what it will do that if you throw in a formulon hole PR on the right, okay, then it will transmit the formulon to the left and reflect the hole back to the right, right? Because D instantons transmit a formulon from right to left. So the final state will consist of a formulon on the right and the hole on the left, okay, but this does not have a regular closed string description. So if you throw in a closed string, it basically goes into something which doesn't have a regular closed string description. Uh, I so can, can ask a question here. Yes. So you said uh, in the beginning that you don't really have to include these states as asymptotic states. But is this true? Uh, or should you enlarge the Hilbert space of asymptotic states beyond the one described just by closed strings? Yeah. So D0 brain, so you have to include our asymptotic states, but not D instantons. So the D instanton is a tunneling instanton here, right? So, so the, the okay. So the Hilbert space is just spanned by uh, essentially the, the two scalars, the closed string uh, Hilbert space. You, yeah. you don't need anything and, more than and that. And you can add formulas, for example, right? Formulas are the D the D zero brains in the theory. Okay. But not the D instantons, right? D instantons are a finite ex action uh, configuration which basically allows the tunneling. Yeah, they are transient uh, objects. But think, okay, in order to define the vacuum state, you should sum over all these sectors, right? In some sense or not? Yes, indeed. Okay, okay. that is true. But they are not asymptotic states, right? You so don't scatter these right? That's what I meant by saying that these are not asymptotic states. Okay, so the upshot of this discussion is that the D instant on induced processes. Okay, or anti-D instanton inducing uh, processes seem to produce states which do not have a regular closed string description. Right? You throw in a closed string and you produce something which doesn't look like a closed string because formula is on the left and the hole is on the right or vice versa. 
And this has a reflection in the Dean Stanton amplitude in string theory. Okay, that if you forget about the matrix model, and if you calculate Dean Stanton amplitude in string theory, okay, what one finds is that there is infrared divergence in the cylinder partition function, and this we'll discuss in some detail in a few minutes. And this makes the amplitudes with finite number of external closed string states vanish. Okay. So that's the way this effect shows up on the string theory side, that if you try to calculate a closed string amplitude induced by Dean Stanton's, you find that the amplitude simply vanishes because of the infrared divergences. So what we'll try to do in this talk is to define appropriate infrared finite semi-inclusive cross-section induced by Dean Stanton. And then we'll compare the results on the string theory side, okay, the semi-inclusive cross-section with the matrix models. Okay, so this will be the goal. And these are the references that I'll be following. Okay. So now let me say a few words about how the D instanton induced amplitudes are calculated. Okay. So the asymptotic states will take to be the closed strings. Okay, so a bunch of closed strings come in, bunch of closed strings go out. And you want to calculate the D instanton induced amplitudes for this process. Now, as I said, the systematic calculation will involve summing over world sheets. Okay, so you start with the world sheet which gives the maximum contribution, okay, which has the lowest power of GS. Okay. And that basically means that you go, you have to go to the lowest possible value of the genus. Now, one point that is special to Dean Stanton's is that the individual wall sheets with boundaries on the Dean Stanton do not conserve energy or momentum. Okay, and that's because the Dean Stanton boundary condition are basically breaking space-time transfers and invariance, right? I mean, even though there is an X naught, right? The Dean Stanton boundary condition violates energy. And as a result, we can have disconnected wall sheet even for generic values of external energy or momentum because the individual wall sheets do not carry uh, conserve energy or momentum. In fact, even in normal quantum field theory, we can have disconnected diagrams. But the reason that we don't include disconnected diagrams is because a disconnected diagram will have separate energy momentum conservation for each connected component. Okay, for a, so for a generic the momentum, these kind of diagrams don't contribute. Okay. But this is not the case for D instantons. So in D instanton amplitude, if you want to get want to get the leading contribution to the D instanton amplitude, we basically have to num maximize the number of disks because each disk gives a factor of one over G string, right? Disk has Euler number minus one, so Euler number one. And so it gives a contribution of one over G string. And furthermore, we can use as many annuli or cylinder as we want because each annulus, okay, annulus has chi equal to Euler number zero. And so it gives you a zeroth power of GS, that means a constant. Okay. So you don't lose any power of coupling constant by including as many annulus as you want. Okay. So even at the leading order, the instant of amplitude, okay, the amplitude has the following structure. First of all, you have this exponential of minus pi by gs. This is the D instant on action. Okay. Then you have to use exponential of the annulus partition function okay. because the annulus can be used as many times as you like. Okay, so it starts from no annulus or one annulus or two annulus and so on. Okay. And then depending on how many close external closed strings you have, if you have n closed strings, you have a product of n disk amplitude with one closed string inserted at the center of every disk. So this is the leading, the structure of the leading contribution due to the instantons. And then of course there are corrections where you can replace say, you can put two vortex, two closed string vortex operator on a single disk, or you can have a closed string vortex operator inserted on an annulus and so on. Okay, those will be higher order contribution. Now this, Exponential of the annulus will be the main player in the game, at least for today's lecture. So it turns out that for the case under consideration for the type 2b string theory, if you calculate the exponential of the annulus amplitude, it's given by exponential of this integral, where this t or 2t is essentially the ratio of the circumference to the width of the cylinder. So the integration over two, uh, t basically means that you are integrating about the, all the shapes of the annulus. Okay, all the 
ratios of circumference to the weight. And the fact that this, this is the integral that follows by looking at the details of the open string spectrum on the DM center, right? Because it's essentially trace of um, e to the minus two pi t times the L0 of the open string. Now, if you look at this integral, we see that this diverges both at large and at small. T. So it turns out that divergence at large t is associated with the open string zero modes. And this divergence will treat using open string field theory, and this we'll discuss soon. The divergence at small t, okay, now well, let me just explain why is the divergence at large t associated with open string zero modes. You see, large t means that the circumference to the width is large, which means the width is going to zero. And so the width of the cylinder going to zero means that a strip is uh, getting uh, yeah, contracted. Okay, the strip is becoming narrow, and that's the open string degeneration. Okay. So that's the way you know that the large tree divergence is coming from the open string degeneration. Okay. Whereas a small tree divergence, when t is small, then that means that the circumference is becoming small. Okay, the width, the width remaining fixed, circumference is becoming small. Okay, that basically means that the cylinder, the circle of the cylinder is becoming small size, right? And that's the closed string degeneration. Okay, so this divergence at small t, in fact, cannot be treated using open string field theory. One needs uh, the analog of the closed string field theory. Okay. And this, in fact, is the usual infra divergence that we encounter even in QED. Okay. It's that kind of divergence because it's coming from the closed string channel. Okay. And this divergence actually makes the amplitude vanish. Okay. So this on the string on the string theory side, the vanishing of the exponential of the annulus. Okay. In a sense, is reflecting the impossibility of a single de instanton process to produce finite number of final state closed strings. Right? In the uh, from the matrix model viewpoint, right, it's a very straightforward uh, thing to see that if you throw in a closed string, it basically splits into a formula on one side and the hole on the other side, and hence it doesn't have a closed string description. This uh, manifests itself on the string theory side as this infrared divergence in the closed string channel. Okay, the divergence from the t equal to zero end. Okay, now we'll come back to this the instant on process in a few minutes. Uh, but uh, let's first consider. Sorry, sorry, yes. sorry for, for sorry for interrupting again. So uh, we know from higher dimensions that there are also other bases of states that one could use for asymptotic states when there are infrared divergence, like Fadev Cooley states, right? So yeah, yeah. Would it be a you know an indication that essentially the Hilbert space that people use in the clustering Hilbert space is not a good description or? Yeah, I think that's one way of saying this. That I mean, in this case, I mean from the matrix model side, right? One knows what one should do. That once you go to the formula basis, mm -hmm. right? Which from the string theory side will mean that if you use the d brain basis, right, the d zero brain states as your basis states instead of the closed string states, you should get a finite answer. Right. right. But the point is from the string theory, uh, from perturbative string theory, at least we don't know how to uh, uh, calculate amplitudes of that kind. Right. That if you throw in two closed strings and if you are trying to ask for production of a pair of D0 brands, okay. right, we just don't have the technology to uh, uh, calculate these processes. Right. That's why we uh, I mean, have to work with closed string basis and see if using that basis, you can extract some useful numbers. Okay. But certainly, I mean, what it suggests is you should go to a different basis. Okay, so let me consider now a de instant and anti de instant and induced process. Okay, and we'll see why. Okay, because this, this will actually have already information about the de instant and induced process. Okay. So what is the difference? Okay, so first of all, the overall factor will be to the minus two pi by gs instead of to the minus pi by gs because you have the action of the d instanton and the action of the anti d instanton. Then, where you had an exponential of the cylinder amplitude or the annulus amplitude, okay, that is now replaced by a sum of various kinds of annulus amplitude. So, this is the annulus with both ends on the d instanton. This is the annulus with both ends on the anti d instanton. And this is the annulus with one end on the d instanton and the other end on the anti d instanton. Okay, so you have to 
sum over all these annulus amplitudes. And finally, each this quant point function that we had, we had said, we, I said that we should get products of these quant point functions. Okay. Now, in, here, instead of getting product of these quant point functions, we have the product of the sum of two these quant point functions, one where the boundary ends on the D instanton, and the other where the boundary ends on the anti D instanton. Okay. And here, I have explicitly written down the result for this sum, okay, because we will be using this. Okay. So let me explain this notation. So sigma here okay, takes value either one or minus one, depending on whether the closed string that is inserted is incoming or outgoing. Okay. P is the Liouville momentum that the closed string carries. Okay. Omega E is the Euclidean energy okay, that is related to the, uh, uh, the Lorentzian energy by minus I times omega. Okay. And X1 and X2 that you see are basically the positions of the D instanton and the anti-D instanton where they are located in the time direction. Okay, the Euclidean uh, uh, location of the uh, uh, deal center and the anti deal center. And the plus and minus here okay, basically uh, reflects what kind of state you are inserting, what kind of closed string states you have. If the closed string state corresponds to chi r, then the sign is plus. If it corresponds to chi l, then the sign is minus. Okay, so now again, let's go back to the exponential of the annulus because that's what causes the divergences. So this expression in, for, in the alpha prime equal to units is given by here, given by this. Now, if you examine this, one thing you can notice immediately is that the divergence from the small t region has gone away. Okay, that was a closed string channel divergence. And now you see that as t goes to zero, this minus two and plus two cancels. Okay. So there is no divergence from the closed string channel. Okay. And that basically means that the infrared divergence, right, which made the original uh, uh, single D instant induced process vanish, okay, is no longer uh, going to make the amplitude vanish okay. because the closed string divergence has gone away. And that is expected because once you have D instant on and anti D instant on, Okay. Then the process produces a final set closed string. Because if you take a D instanton and an anti D instanton, then if a fermion hole PR comes from the right, okay, both fermion and hole can get transmitted okay, and produce a regular closed string. Okay. So from the matrix model side, we know that the D instanton and anti D instanton induced processes produces regular closed string in the final state. And that is what that, the reflection of that is you are seeing in string theory side by the fact that there is no divergence in the closed string channel. However, there are still divergences in the open string channel from the large tree region. And that divergence comes because of this minus two. You can see clearly that the integral is divergent for large t. And this term okay, is not divergent as long as x1 minus x2 is large enough. But when x1 minus x2 becomes less than 2 pi, this is also divergent. And that basically reflects the fact that when the d instant and anti d instant are coming sufficiently close to each other, then there's a tachyonic mode that develops, okay, from open strings that connect the D instanton to the anti D instanton. Okay, and that's the divergence we see for small enough x1 minus x2. Now, here I'll just state briefly how you deal with these divergences using open string field theory. Okay, although that will be not the main thrust of the talk. Okay. So the systematic procedure for dealing with this large divergence is given here. So first to use the identities that is valid for HB and HF zero uh, positive. Okay, and this is the identity. Okay, that this integ an integral of this kind you can show is equal to square root of HF over HB. Then these are two other identities that if you take something like one over square root of HB that you see appearing here, okay, this can be written as a Gaussian integral of this form. Okay, where phi b is a Grassmann even variable. And if you have some factor of HF in the numerator, okay, this can be written as, a, as an integration over a pair of Grassmann odd variables, okay, dpf dqf times e to the minus HF pf qf. Okay. And so what one finds is that when you express this, in, an expression of this kind using these identities, okay, as some kind of integrals, okay, then we can interpret these modes, 
okay the integration that appears in this uh, by doing this okay as open string integration over the open string fields okay now here open string fields basically mean that it's are zero dimensional fields because d instanton is really a point like object okay nevertheless we can call these open string fields okay and these uh, these terms which appear in the exponent are in fact precisely the open string field theory action Okay. So here I am uh, doing a bottom-up approach, but if we had started from an open string field theory and written on the path integral okay, over the open string fields, you would have exactly produced expressions of this kind by uh, running these arguments in the backward direction. Right? You just integrate out the open string fields, you produce these uh, expressions of this kind, numerator from the fermion, from the Grassmann you know, odd variables, and denominator, denominator from the Grassmann even variables, and then these you can re-express. Re as exponential of the annular partition function of this type. Now, this, this is of course valid for positive HF and HB, but now we can ask what happens when HF and HB are negative or zero. Okay. And for this, let's use the right hand side, okay, these expressions. Okay. Now, from this perspective, we can see that modes with negative HB. Are like tachyonic modes because uh, they are give divergent integrals. Okay, because this sign uh, uh, HB is negative, so this is exponentially growing. Okay, but of course, when you think of these as the integration over the, the modes of the string, okay, or the string fields, then you know what to do with it. Right? We basically have to carry out the integration along the steepest descent point, right? Because these are saddle points or the path integral, and the way you can take into account the effect of the saddle points in the path integral is that you always choose the steepest descent contour to integrate along. Okay. So you can make sense of the, the tachyonic force that way. Okay. And essentially what this means is that you will get square root of 1 over HB, but HB will be negative. Right? And this imaginary part basically comes because you are, the steepest descent contour is along the imaginary axis. Now, more interesting cases are the ones with the modes with HB equal to 0 and HF equal to 0. Okay. Because they represent the bosonic and formionic zero modes. Okay. So these are like the zero modes of instantons. Okay. And the integration over the zero modes have to be treated carefully. And here again, the insight from quantum field theory plays a role. Okay. In quantum field theory, you have instantons, and instantons typically also have zero modes. Okay. And you know that those zero mode integrals have to be done carefully. You cannot treat them using Feynman diagrams. So it turns out that in the present example, okay, that minus two that we see, okay, that minus two we had here, basically comes from two bosonic zero modes. These are associated with the freedom of translating the instant on and anti instant along the Euclidean time. And the way to deal with these zero, bosonic zero modes is essentially that we change variables from the bosonic zero modes to the d instant on positions x1 and x2. Right? Because these are the origins of the, you know, these are the reason for getting the zero modes because the D instanton can move. Okay. Now, in this process, you'll pick up some Jacobian factor, which has to be carefully accounted for. Right? That the bosonic zero mode that you see in the open string uh, field theory are related to x1 and x2, but they are not exactly x1 and x2. Okay. Now, this gives you plus two, okay. but uh, yeah. we also have four formionic zero modes. And these, in fact, come from the ghost and anti ghost pair on the instant on the anti instant on. And these come from as a result of wrongly fixing the U1 gauge symmetry on the instant on and the anti instant on. And I'll just explain this in the next slide, okay, as to where this, what you mean by this wrongly fixing the U1 gauge symmetry. So for this, let's just forget about D instantons for a minute, okay, and consider the open string field theory on a general DP pair. Now we know that DP brains have U1 gauge fields, and the U1 gauge field in open string field theory, okay, appears in a somewhat unusual fashion. Okay, the action for the U1 gauge field that you get by analyzing the open string field theory action okay, takes this form. Okay. So it has the usual Maxwell term. Okay. But it also has a coupling to an auxiliary field. Okay. So the phi is some kind of auxiliary field in the open string in the, uh, field theory. Okay. And it has the structure of minus one quarter f mu f mu, this is the usual Maxwell action. And then there is a uh, cross term between a and phi of this form. Okay. Now, this, of course, is entirely equivalent to the Maxwell action because if you just carry out the integration over phi, 
Okay, you can just integrate this out. But let's just keep it this way. And the gauge transformation in this theory takes this form. The delta mu is the standard gauge transformation, but with, with that delta phi, okay, the phi changes by box of the gauge transformation parameter. And you can easily con check that this is a gauge invariant combination, okay, under this transformation. Okay. So phi is really like an auxiliary scalar. And now the way we do gauge fixing in string theory, okay, and what we call Siegel gauge, is that we set phi equal to zero. So if you set phi equal to zero, okay, then these two terms combine to give the standard uh, Feynman propagator, A box phi A. But because you have set phi equal to zero gauge, you have to introduce hosts. Okay? And you can see that the Jacobian of changing variable from phi to theta is this box operator, the Laplacian. So the ghost action will have the form P box Q, where P and Q are the ghost fields. So this is the formalism for a general DP plane. Now we can focus on D in on P equal to minus one. What happens for P equal to minus one? Now what happens for P equal to minus one is that string field theory, of course, uses the same formalism for all, including P equal to minus one. But as a result, we see that this term actually vanishes for D in on because there is no momentum on the D in right? The there's no, uh, the, the, there's no space time direction. So derivative, you can't take derivative with respect to anything. Because there is no x. So p box q is zero. Right? And this, in fact, is the reason why you get this harmonic zero modes. p and q appear as now harmonic zero modes on the deans. And this is what we mean by saying that you have both zero modes. So you have a pair of both zero modes on the D in center and a pair of both zero modes on the D anti D in center. So you have four formulaic zero modes, two bosonic zero modes. That's the origin of this minus two that we saw. Two minus four is minus two. So physically, what's happening is that on the D in center, phi, in fact, nothing transforms on the gauge transformation because there's a the momentum. So there is no A mu, first of all, because the D in center is zero dimensional. There is a phi. But it doesn't transform under gauge transformation. Delta phi is zero. It's gauge invariant. But the usual form, wall sheet formalism doesn't know this. Right? The wall sheet formalism always gives the single gauge fix formalism, single gauge fix form of the path integral. So as far as the wall sheet formalism goes, it still tries to fix phi equal to zero gauge. And as a result, the ghost action becomes singular. There is a, the, the ghost action just vanishes. So this is what I've said, the ghost zero modes arise because we are attempting to gauge fix a rigid symmetric parameter theta. And once you understand the origin of this ghost zero modes, it's also clear what you should do, that you have to undo the gauge fixing by using a gauge invariant form of the path integral, which means that you have to integrate over phi. Don't fix phi equal to zero gauge because phi is gauge invariant. We have to drop the integration over the ghosts, okay? because once you don't gauge fix, there is a ghost. And then we have to divide by the volume of the gauge group because we are using a gauge invariant formula. Okay, so you have the path integral over all the gauge or the, all the fields on the numerator, and you have to divide. We have a division by the volume of the gauge group in the denominator. So division by the volume of the gauge group basically basically means that you have to find the period of this variable theta, and this can be found by carefully examining. The, basically, you compare the string field theory gauge transformation laws with the usual U1 gauge transformation law, right? Psi goes to I alpha Psi. Okay. So basically by comparing the transformation laws, we can find a relation between theta and alpha. And then we simply use the fact that alpha has period two pi. Okay, that determines the volume of the gauge group as measured by theta. Okay. So this is the procedure that one uses to deal with these open string zero modes. And at the end, one gets a perfectly finite result. Okay, so this is what I've said here, that this procedure has been applied to many different kinds of string theories. Okay. And in every case, when there is a dual description, the result agrees with what you get from the dual description. Okay, and here are the various examples that for which it has been applied. Okay. So we'll now, don't, don't, we won't give the details of this analysis. Okay, the, the, I've explained the general you know, procedure. We'll just quote the final result that one gets by doing this. 
And this is what one gets. The cylinder partition function on the DD bar in type 0B okay, essentially gives you this. Okay. These are the integration over the zero modes, over the bosonic uh, zero modes, right? That gives the DN centron and anti DN centron positions. Okay. And the exponential that we had, okay, after you follow this procedure, just produces a factor like this. Okay. And here I should say that the integration over x1 and x2 needs to be done after taking the product of with the t-squant functions, right? This is only the annulus contribution. Okay. Now you have to multiply this, the integrand, by the d squant point functions, and then you have to do the integration over x1 and x2. Okay. So this normalization, in fact, agrees with the matrix model result. Okay. So this Balthazar Rodriguez and Nin, that the paper that I mentioned, they had in fact studied this earlier, okay, and compared the matrix model results, except that they couldn't determine this overall normalization from the string theory side, okay, because they had this divergent contribution, right? They just said that they replace the divergent contribution by an unknown constant C, and then they determine this constant C by comparing with the matrix model result, and they had found exactly C equal to 1 over 4 pi squared. So the explicit string theory calculation using open string field theory reproduces whatever they had found by comparing with the matrix model result. And the other thing I should just say is that here you can see that there is a singularity at x1 equal to x2 plus minus 2 pi. This Singularity, so the integration over x1 and x2 have to be done using principal value prescription. Okay, and that's the only prescription that preserves unitarity. Okay, now let me describe the uh, some of the results of this calculation okay. and the kind of subtleties that one encounters with unitarity. So let me denote by Mn the n incidental contribution to some scattering amplitude. So suppose you are doing a scattering amplitude of some initial state A to some final state B. Okay. And Mn AB is the n incidental contribution. Okay. And we will focus on a specific A and B where the incoming state is a closed string state chi r of energy omega 1. And the final state is a closed string chi r of energy omega 2. And we'll focus on the simple case, the two instant or instant or anti-instant contribution to a scattering of one to one. Okay, you throw in a closed string and you get reflected. Okay. And this is the answer that one finds for this amplitude. Now, if we have a unitary theory, okay. then we have to satisfy S dagger S equal to one. Okay. Now, perturbative amplitudes are unitary by itself that you can check. So the instant on contribution, in order that the instant on contribution is unitary, okay, we have to satisfy a relation of this form, m2 plus m2 star plus m1 m1 star, okay, right? this is the SS S dagger contribution, this should be equal to zero. Okay, so this is a statement of unitarity. Okay. But now you see that there is a puzzle, okay, because m2 plus m2 star doesn't vanish, as you can see from here, right? this is real, not imaginary. And this one we have argued earlier is zero because single de instant and induced processes gives you zero, right? Because of the infinite divergence. So it look, it appears as if we are violating unitarity because this le right, left hand side is not zero. Okay. So there's an apparent contradiction. And we will now see how we go get around this apparent contradiction. Okay. So for this, we have to basically manipulate our expressions a bit. Okay. So first, we go back to the original expression that we had. Okay, let me show you that expression, this expression over here. Okay, exponential of the annulus. And we'll have to massage it by rewriting in a slightly different form. Okay, so this expression that I've written here, okay, essentially is the same expression that we had to begin with. Okay. The only thing I've done is that we have added and subtracted several terms, right? For example, this term over here exactly cancels this term. Okay. Here, the fact that you have integrated from epsilon to infinity okay, is compensated by this Debye-Side function, this step function. So this integral produces the integral from zero to epsilon, okay, dt over t. Okay, so basically, this plus this together gives you back the zero to infinity integral. Okay. 
and this integral was also present to begin with. So the first two lines is basically the exponential of the annular partition function. And these two terms are the product of the d square point functions. Okay. And the reason that you have organized it this way is because you have separated out the t goes to infinity region from the t going to zero region. Okay. The closed and open string divergences have been separated out. Okay, even though as it stands, there is really no divergence in the closed string channel. Okay, nevertheless, we have expired, we have separated out the possible divergences from the t goes to zero region. Now the first line is easy to analyze. Okay, so the first line, so these are I've written the first line here. Okay. So this part has apparent divergence from the t goes to infinity n, but that's the open string channel divergence, and this can be dealt with using string field theory. Okay. So after we evaluate this using the string field theory analysis, okay, we find that we get an expression of this kind. Okay, so this is coming from the blue part, okay, and this is of course a finite integral. Okay, you can easily do this, and we find that this integral is given by this expression over here. Okay, this is in a small epsilon limit. Okay. Now I'm going to write down an expression for this part. Okay, and here it is. So this, so the claim is that the rest of the terms can be manipulated to give an expression like this. Now this doesn't look anything like what we had before, right? Because there's a k in, the, k in this case is a two-dimensional Euclidean momentum. Okay, I've written down <coughs> explicitly what this means. So it involves an integration over the Liouville momentum and the energy. And you can now ask, how can we go back to the original expression that we had earlier here? Okay. And the uh, point is that you can get, get back to the original expression by following the a series of steps. So first of all, you have to write this one over k e square using the swinger parameterization. Okay. Once you do that, then the k integrals becomes Gaussian integral. Okay, you can uh, do the k integral. Okay, so do the k integral, and then in the resulting integral, okay, you change variable from s to t, which is t equal to one over two s. So this is the closed string. This so this s is like the closed string channel swinger parameter. T is like the open string channel swinger parameter. So the claim is that if you follow these steps, you will basically get back to this line, the second line. Now, the reason that you have done it is because you want to reinterpret this as Feynman diagrams involving the closed strings. Okay, and we'll see in the next slide what the Feynman diagram expression is. Now, if you look at this expression, you can see that this, as it stands, has no divergence no infrared divergence in the closed string channel. Because, so K is the moment, you can think of as a momentum in the closed string channel. Okay? But as K goes to zero, you can see that this term and this term cancels, right? It's one minus one. So there is really no divergence in the close, from the closed string channel, closed string infrared divergence. Okay? Nevertheless, what you are going to do is to, you are going to put a lower cutoff on the P integral to regulate possible infrared divergences. Okay? Because once you put the lower cutoff, we are now going to split up this term into a sum of several terms, each of which will diverge, divert if you take eta goes to zero. Okay. But the idea is that you will not take eta goes to zero till you combine them. Okay. But in the intermediate stage, it is useful to split it up into sum over many terms, each of which will diverge as eta goes to zero. Okay. For example, if we take this term by itself, it, it diverges as k goes to zero. Right. This term also diverges as k goes to zero. Okay, it's only the combination that doesn't diverge. And now I'm going to make a claim that if we now expand out the exponential by writing this as a sum of terms, okay, we can give this a Feynman diagram interpretation. Okay. And here is the claim okay, that by expanding the exponential, this one goes to one amplitude that I wrote down, that whose expression I wrote down, Okay. can be written as a sum of Feynman diagrams. Okay. So these Feynman diagrams, as you see, uses three kinds of vortex. Okay. This black dot is, a, is what I'll call a dean center induced vortex. Okay. The empty circle is the anti dean center induced vortex. Okay. And this is a composite vortex. Okay. So in the next slide, I'm going to write down the expression for these vortices, which will not be very illuminating. 
Okay. But the main point is that after you formally sum over all these Feynman diagrams and exponentiate, okay, you basically get back the expression that I had here. Okay. So it looks like that we had a simple expression. We are trying, trying to make it more complicated. Okay. But the reason for making this uh, more complicated will become clear in a minute. Okay, so here are the expressions for the various vortices. Okay, the purpose of writing this is just to show that you have concrete expression for all the vortices. Okay. And when you put all of them to, uh, together, okay, you get back this expression. And here I should also just point out this y is essentially this x1 minus x2. Okay. And here we have to use the fact that the y integral has to be done using this principal value integral. That means you have to average over taking the y contour slightly above the real axis and slightly below the real axis. Okay. And it's only under that circumstances that this, this particular vortex okay, that you saw appearing in this expression, okay, this vortex, for example, corresponds to real term in the closed string effective action. Okay, so that's the reason why you use principal value estimation. And here I have also written down the propagators and the integration measure over the internal momentum, right? So the Feynman rules are completely explicitly known. Okay. Now, once you have expressed the result as how over Feynman diagrams, okay, and once you also know that the vortices correspond to real terms in the closed string effective action, then unitarity is manifest, right? It just follows from the Kutkowski rules. So what is Kutkowski rules? Kutkowski rule tells us, tells us that this minus m2 plus m2 star that we are trying to calculate okay, should be given by sum of cut diagrams. Okay. And the only kind of cuts that these diagrams can have right, are cutting this and this, right? Because here there is a cut. Okay. And here also there is a cut because both lines, both external lines connect to a single vortex. Right? So you cannot cut something on which, um, because on the right of this, there's not, there's nothing, there's no external state. Okay. So these are the only diagrams that can be cut. Okay. And this clearly has the interpretation of M1 dagger M1, right? Because D instantan induced amplitude times anti D instantan induced amplitude or anti D instantan induced amplitude and D instantan induced amplitude. Okay. So from this expression, it looks like, okay, formally that, we should have minus m2 plus m2 star equal to m1 dagger m1 okay? because that's the Kutkowski rules. Okay, and because you have some of Feynman diagrams, Kutkowski rules hold. Okay, so these results should hold. Okay. But now you have a puzzle, right? Because m2 and m2 star are non zero that we have already seen. I have given the expressions. m1 is supposed to vanish because of the infrared diagrams. So it looks like that Kutkowski rule tells us that this. A minus m2 plus m2 star should be equal to m1 dagger m1. On the other hand, m1 is supposed to vanish. So how can this be true? Okay. And this, in fact, has a simple explanation, and that's the following. Okay. That what one finds that if we keep the number of cut propagators fixed okay. and sum over all possible virtual closed strings, right? That means if you number, suppose the number of cut propagators you keep to be fixed, some five or six or ten. And then sum over all the virtual loops, okay, and exponentiate. Then the result indeed does vanish as we take the IR cut of eta to zero, okay, because essentially it's the same as in quantum electrodynamics, right? The virtual loops gives you exponential of minus infinity, which makes the diagram vanish. Okay. But if we keep eta fixed and sum over all uh, possible number of propagators, right? Then instead of keeping the number of cut propagators fixed, okay, we sum over all possible uh, 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 number of cut propagators, exponentiate it, okay, combine with the virtual loop contribution, and then take eta goes to zero limit, then you get finite result. And indeed, that finite result agrees with the unitary prediction. Okay. So, what it is saying is that in this M1 dagger M1, right, that we had, if the number of intermediate states, if you insist that the number of intermediates, the intermediate states, consists of a finite number of closed strings, then M1 dagger M1 is indeed zero. Okay. But if we first sum over all possible closed strings, which includes infinite number, right? You exponentiate. Then M1 dagger M1 gives a finite result, 
as you take the infrared cut off to zero. Okay. So in other words, while the probability of producing any finite number of closed strings in the final state is zero, the probability of producing infinite number of closed strings is non-zero and agrees with the unitary prediction. Okay. So this, you can say, is formal. Okay, we have established unitarity. Can we do anything better? Okay. And if, in fact, we can do uh, something more. Because once you have understood how unitarity is realized, right, we can now compute semi-inclusive cross-section. Okay. Now, what is semi-inclusive cross-section? Okay, so the question that we ask is, what is the cross-section for producing a fixed set of closed strings in specific energy range plus anything? Okay. And that anything could involve arbitrary number of closed strings, infinite number of closed strings. So how do you go about calculating this? Okay. So what we need to do is that in a cut diagram like this, okay, suppose you want to say that we have fixed 10 final states with specific property. Okay. So you take 10 cut propagators okay, and fix that momentum in certain range. And then you sum over all other possible cut propagators. Okay, Arbitrary number of cut propagators you sum over. That is what we mean by semi-inclusive process. And you fix certain characteristics of the final state, and then you allow everything else to be produced, consistent with the energy conservation. So this, then we can calculate, and indeed you can get a finite result. I'll write down the result in the next slide. So the point is, specification of the final state closed strings can be done either in the NSR basis or in the chi l chi r basis. Okay, it's useful to... I mean, we'll choose the chi l chi r basis, right? It's just going from you know, phi ns plus phi r and phi ns minus phi r. Those are the chi l and chi r. Okay. We'll take the incoming state to be a single chi r, okay, and allow for certain final states. Okay. And here is the result on finds by following this procedure that we fix the energy of the final card propagators in size of, of a set of card propagators in certain range and then allow the race to be summed over. Okay. So what is this in answer to? Let me explain this. So this sum, prime over, sum, sum over n prime means that we are summing over all final states with some specific characteristics okay, that includes all final states, which has R right sector closed string states of energies in certain range, and L left sector closed string states of energies in certain range, and then any number of other closed string states. Okay. And this is the result that one finds. Okay, we can see that this is perfectly finite. It's in a, there's no infrared divergence here. Okay. And uh, you can calculate this using this uh, string field theory picture. Okay, that you just uh, sum over these cut diagrams. Okay, now since I've already uh, taken one hour, let me just state the results in the matrix model. So what happens? Either you can do the computation in the matrix model. Okay. And in fact, in the matrix model, okay, we can do the computation in a much simpler fashion. Okay. <clears throat> and that has to do with the change of basis. Okay. So the way one can do the calculation in the matrix model is that we specify the final state by saying that you have a state of uh, uh, closed strings in the final state. Okay, That is exactly the same as you have specified here. Okay. And then when you sum over all other final states, okay, arbitrary final state, for that we can choose a formula in places. Instead of having to sum over all possible other final states, final closed string states, we say that we have a certain number of closed string states produced in a final state, okay, and then we produce arbitrary number of formulas and whole pairs in a final state, right? You, you are, because the states that we don't <coughs> want to specify, okay, those for those, you can use the formula basis, right? You don't have to use uh, uh, the formula whole PR basis. Okay. And this basically makes the calculation much simpler. Okay, and you can get the result without encountering any infrared divergence at all. Okay. So let me uh, show the, the form of the final result that one gets. So this is the result that one gets. Okay. It's essentially the transmission amplitude of the formula or the hole that comes in. Okay. <clears throat> and you have to do a single integral. So you can get the result directly using the formula uh, and whole PR basis, and the result agrees with the string theory result. So this is the way to get the final result without encountering any infrared divergence, even in the intermediate stage. 
Okay. Whereas, as we have seen in the, on the string theory side, okay, you have to produce, put the infrared cutoff eta, okay, do the resummation of what all the final set closed string states, and then at the end, eta goes to zero. Okay, and that reproduces exactly the same result. So this is what I have already said. Then the matrix model side about the infrared divergences. Okay. Now on the string theory side, you know that the role of single polygons and holes is played by the rolling tachyon configuration or unstable dependence. Okay. And so this suggests that if in string theory you could calculate amplitudes with such final states, then perhaps we could avoid the infrared divergences even at the intermediate stages. Okay, that you don't have to use these closed string states as the final state basis. But at present, we don't really have the technology to do that, right? Because you don't know how to calculate deep red production cross section in string theory. Okay. So I'll end this talk with a final speculation. Okay. And that is the fact that is the statement that the rolling tachyon solution are unstable deep reds, right? Say, including D0 reds, they also exist in critical string theory. Okay. So, for example, type 2B string theory. Okay. Doesn't have a stable D0 brain, but it has an unstable D0 brain. And again, you can uh, set up the ta rolling tachyon configuration on those unstable D0 brains. Okay. And these could provide a new basis of states in even in critical string theory, okay, which may be more useful than the usual closed string basis states for some computation. Okay. And here is one such possible uh, application. Okay. Now, we know in the context of two-dimensional string theory that the free formula basis is better suited for computing the entanglement entropy in the matrix model. Okay, in the matrix model, if you want to calculate the entanglement entropy in certain interval, okay, then the uh, scalar basis actually give divergent contribution at each order in part of the theory. And you have to resum to try to get a finite result. Okay. Whereas the free formula basis, if you use that to calculate the entanglement entropy, you get a finite result. Okay. So it will perhaps be worth exploring if the basis of rolling tachyon states in critical string theory can provide a more useful basis of computing entanglement entropy in string theory. Okay. This is just one possible application of this free formula basis. Okay, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, uh, any questions for Ashok? Maybe I can start with with just a general question about the like the possibility that we could figure out how to do these calculations with incoming D zero brains. I mean, is there any idea how how that could eventually be understood? Yeah, at least right now we don't know uh -huh. because uh, I mean we, the way we think of the D brains is that those are, those are providing fixed backgrounds, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you calculate the closed string scattering of them. I mean, one could perhaps calculate things like a D0 brain with a closed string going into a D0 brain and closed string. <clears throat> because then the D0 brain is not a start, right? You just think of D0 brain as a background and the closed string is getting scattered from the D0 brain. Okay? But even there, the fact that the closed string scattering you know, puts a momentum on the D0 brain, that's not easy to take into account. right? Because you think of the D0 brain as a fixed background. So maybe one can start with that and then maybe do some kind of a, uh, uh, crossing to see if one can get the D0 band PR production, for example. Mm -hmm. okay. But uh, yeah, it looks hard because uh, we are very far from that region, right? Where you actually pair produce D0 band. Right. So normally the kind of scattering you would do is that you have a low energy close string coming in Right and scatter of the of a D zero brain. Okay. Once you have the closed string energy that is big enough to produce D zero brain, right? Then the even the usual uh, perturbation theory probably will not work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess somehow in 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 a using some duality or like in an M theory description, it seems like it's all just. Yeah, yeah. So of course, in the dual description, it's possible. Yeah. yeah, because in the dual description, D zero brains may be light states, right? Yeah, 
Yeah. And then there will be uh, American produce there in scattering. Hmm. The question is whether in the weakly coupled type to be string theory, yeah. you can produce D0 brands by scattering. Yeah, um, it seems that I mean, if you could actually describe this, then you could get this matrix model kind of, kind of results directly in the close uh, using the worship picture. Mm -hmm. Right, instead of having to sum over infinite number of closed string final states. Right, right. Has anyone explored? Have Have you thought about this last speculation? It's interesting about the, the entanglement entropy. Is there anything more more specific that you've thought about, or? or... That other people have investigated. Not really, but okay. I mean, this calculation is purely in the matrix model. Yeah. Right. So first, one can ask, even in two-dimensional string theory, right? Could one, I mean, formulate the, the the problem of calculating entanglement entropy using the deep branch as basis states. Right. Right. Yeah, but I don't think anybody has really you know, looked at that. I mean, the same matrix, I mean, here you know the result, right? So it should be easier. I mean, you know what the entanglement entropy is from the matrix model calculation. And one can ask is if it's possible to reproduce it from the string theory side using some of these zero brands as basis states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's quite interesting. It's the entanglement entropy when, when you're in some stringy regime is seems still very puzzling. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and if you are to believe this matrix model results, it would seem that using the strings as the elementary constituents is probably not the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Right, for mm -hmm. the entire interval calculations. Right. right. Also, so if I remember, there is also a gap there because uh, they had to take the cut where you compute the entanglement entropy near the weakly coupled region, right? Only asymptotically. Because near yeah. the strongly coupled region, is, it's very non local, the mapping between the matrix eigenvalues and the target space coordinate, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that I, I agree, agree. In the strong coupling region, of course, things are very confusing. But we can ask even in the weakly coupled region, right? Can you do this calculation? See, because. Um, in critical string theory, for example, even in the free limit, right? People don't know how to calculate the entanglement entropy, right? Extracting a finite answer. <clears throat> so I think understanding the weakly coupled region itself will be a big problem. Right. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's let's thank Ashok again. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for I, I guess it's thank you. fairly thanks late so there, hopefully. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs>